The following is distributed by the Berean Call. The psychological seduction of Christianity today is probably more pervasive than it has ever been before. And we just have seen this over and over again, and it's expanding. But let me begin with what's going on around us, because that is where we're getting it from. We're getting it from the world. Psychological counseling theories and therapies have given Americans a new way of thinking. They have turned us into a therapeutic culture of the self, where self and how it feels about itself are at the center of meaning. We have embraced a psychological mindset. This psychological mindset places emotional deprivation and woundedness as the root cause of nearly every social ill and therefore places individual psychological emotional well-being high on the national agenda. The President's New Freedom Commission on Mental Health justifies this plan by saying or declaring mental illnesses rank first among illnesses that cause disability in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe. The mental health establishment has convinced the United States government to fund and promote a plan for pot all potential mental health consumers. Potential mental health consumers Potential? Well, they're going to be screening as many people as possible throughout the United States. They're starting pretty much with the children in the schools. Then they were, they're going into the uh, rest homes for the elderly, and uh, they're going in with the babies, and they're going to try to do all of us. Extensive mental health screening and follow-up treatment. The President's New Commission justifies this plan by declaring, as I said before, that all of this is a serious illness throughout. Now, what constitutes mental illness is, continues to expand to the point where almost every reaction that is not a happy reaction to life circumstances becomes a disability that needs treatment from the mental health establishment. So we live in this therapy culture, and it is so much a therapy culture that one social psychologist who is not a Christian said this, a study of secret churches in the US argues that their ability to attract re new recruits is based upon their ability to tap into the therapeutic understanding of Americans. And what is this therapeutic understanding? It is all about self. First of all, you have the focus on self and its problems, and then you have the treatment that follows, psychological counseling, theories, and therapies. So, this therapeutic mindset promotes Self-love, self-worth, self-esteem, self-fulfillment, reaching one's highest potential, self-improvement, self-absorption, self-nurture. Here is where we're meeting our own emotional needs first. And how many of you, heard, have, you have heard that, you know, if you're going to follow the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, Yourself is really the first. You have to do yourself first, even though Jesus said on these two commandments. So we have the self-nurture. We have self-indulgence, self-enhancement. We see this all around. And now self-transcendence, which elevates the self to a higher spiritual plane without the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the psychological seduction of Christianity is really a direct fulfillment of 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. 
and I'm going to read it. It's a long one, but I'm going to read it because what we find is that the psychological mindset actually encourages and promotes each one of these things that we will see here. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Don't we see that? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. We see this a lot. Not only dishonoring, but disobedience. And this really started with uh, at least, well, we know it started in the Garden of Eden, but with the psychological part, it started with Freud because as far as Freud was concerned, everybody's problems were due to their circumstances and mainly their parents and mainly their mother. So the mother has been to blame all these years. Then, unthankful. Now, how many people are sitting around in therapy being thankful? No, they're complaining and criticizing and thinking everything is wrong. Then, unholy. Without natural affection, more families have been broken up by psychology than we can even count. Truce breakers, false accusers, and we see a lot of that going on. False accusers, not only in the, just the normal kinds of counseling where people are complaining about other people and so forth, but accusations that come from false memories that have been very, very serious, bringing great heartache to many people. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. I mean, if people are around Christians, a lot of times they really don't like them because they suddenly realize that maybe they're a little uncomfortable. And, and so they don't like the people who may be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, and believe me, a lot of these psychological counselors are the nicest people you can meet. They are understanding, they listen, they're just wonderful people, but having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Why are they going after the other stuff? Because they're denying the power of God. They're denying the work of the Holy Spirit in an individual who has been born again. From such, turn away. When the shepherds send their flock out to psychological counselors, they are in effect saying, God cannot fulfill his promise of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You all know this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's a promise that we need to hang on to. That is a promise that has been forgotten. Then, what we have here is the lie. And what is this lie? The cross of Christ, the word of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the fellowship of believers is not enough. Therefore, we need psychological theories about the nature of man, and we need to provide psychological therapy to help them. Now, there are a number of people out there promoting this, but one person, uh, Dr. Bruce Naramore, distinguished professor of psychology at Rosemead School of Psychology, which is part of Biola University, has promoted integration of psychology and Christianity, and this is what he says. I think critics of psychology need to ask, why are people interested in psychology? The thought is that we ought to go back to the old way, but the old way wasn't working. Well, first of all, I'd like to say why people are going into psychology. It's the same reason Eve was interested in the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the knowledge about me. The knowledge about that is out there someplace that we can't find in the word of God. Then Clyde Naramore says this, without proof or evidence, thereby implies that God 
has not been faithful to his people for over 2,000 years when they've had to experience problems of living. Now, psychotherapy has become so popular in the church that if a person comes up to another Christian and, so, and starts sharing a problem, guess what the usual suggestion is? You need counseling. And what kind of counseling do they mean? They mean psychological counseling, professional counseling, or at least counseling provided by somebody who's had training, you know, in who we really are and all the methods of how we're supposed to change. So, now, we'll be talking about psychotherapy and psychological counseling, and basically they're pretty much, they're the same thing. Um, and these things are conducted by psychotherapists, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, marriage and family counselors, social workers, Christian psychologists, and some biblical counselors. And each one will use one or more, and usually a combination, of the 500 different, often conflicting, systems of psychotherapy. Each one will explain why people are the way they are, then each one will have a method, how, how they change. And uh, these methods of change, of course, are primarily through conversation and having, looking at the problem through a particular psychological view and then attempting to, uh, actually the person uh, learns a whole new viewpoint of life and it's a psychological viewpoint and that's how they start changing. Uh, and then they, so they have the new ways of thinking, feeling and behaving. They'll have new beliefs, new attitudes, and believe me, each one has an agenda for how we are to think and behave and feel and so forth. Now, these theories were all created by non-Christians. These theories that are the basic theories that have been, you know, have influenced the Christian psychologists. They were all created by non-Christians, many of whom were opposed to Christianity. And uh, this means that the theories and the uh, therapies were conducted, or were concocted rather, in the realm of darkness rather than in the kingdom of light. In describing Christians, Paul said, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance with saints of light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, even as Christianity is mixed in, the roots of this are from the realm of darkness. Psychotherapy is of the world and therefore is according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past, fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So, people who are using this are really getting help from the wrong source. Now, psychotherapy, therefore, the best it can do is to fix up the flesh, to fix up the old Adamic nature, and to fix up what Paul referred to as the old man, which is corrupt, according to deceitful lusts. So, what the Bible tells us to put off, psychology tells, helps us to put on and fix up and, and get better at and so forth. Now, psychological counselors are actually operating from the realm of religion. You see, um, when we speak of psychotherapy and its underlying psychologies, we are not speaking about something like science. We are speaking of a rival religion. We are speaking of religion where self is God and the psychotherapist is the high priest. So psychological counseling comes from wisdom of fallen men, which God has warned us about. It focuses on self and its problems it deals with the very soul of man and is a false religion. There has been a drastically downward movement since what used to be called the cure of souls, then coming into the secular 
world of psychology. Now, the cure of souls has really been around for a long time, and this is just a name that was put to it. It started in the early church when people would talk with one another, minister to one another, uh, encourage one another in the word, encourage one another in what is true and what is right. And, and then a lot of times there would be things through the years that would be written having to do with things like grief, consolation, repentance, uh, sanctification, and spiritual growth and guidance and so forth. And that was all the cure of souls. However, things have changed drastically and to the point where Dr. Thomas Saws, who happens to be a, uh, an, un an unbeliever, uh, nevertheless sees this as a rival religion and says, with the decline of religion and the growth of science in the 18th century, the cure of sinful souls, which had been an integral part of the Christian religions, was recast as the cure of sick minds and became an integral part of medical science. Now the words sinful and sick, even though they are in parentheses, were his words, but those words are extremely important because they mark the transition from sin to sick. What used to be called sin is now called sick. Now, until about 150 years ago, the word psychology was a pretty good word, actually, because it was a study of the soul from more of a theological perspective, from a biblical perspective. However, beginning with the 18th century, there was an increase in secularists studying the soul. So by the time we have the 20th century, psychology really is almost unusable, as far as I'm concerned, as, as a word to use with the word Christian, because it is really now been taken over by the secular world. It's the study of the soul from a secular perspective. In other words, it's studying the soul apart from God and his word. Now, the psychological theories, theorists who influenced this development of psychotherapy, as I had mentioned, were all secularists and atheists. Some were occultists and avowed haters of Christianity. So here we have the study of the soul apart from God. And until the takeover of secular psychology, people were dealing with their problems, you know, without that kind of help. And Christians were dealing with that problem through a biblical means. And so, and it was just simply through the word of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the fellowship of the saints. Now, how did we get here? How did this ever happen? Well, there were a couple of things that kind of were going on. Um, in the 17th century, we have the 17th century in America, some things that prepared Christians to buy into this. And then we had the 18th century uh, medicine in, in Europe that contributed to it. First, I'll talk about the Christian element that helped us look in this direction. And would you believe these were the godly Puritans? These were the people who wanted to really walk right with God. But what happened was they concluded that sin was really idolatry of the heart. And so they sought to examine people's hearts. So they would look into details by asking about feelings so that the Puritan pastor according to uh, E. Brooks Holyfield, who is a, a, an historian, the Puritan pastor, especially in the 17th century, became a specialist in the cure of the idolatrous heart. He analyzed motives, evaluated feelings, sought to discern hidden intentions and direct inward consent. So they were doing it for the right reason. They were attempting to help people move in the right direction. Little did they realize that focusing so much on analyzing the condition of each individual soul through talking about the inner and outer problems would eventually prepare Christians in America to become open to psychotherapy. Then, during the 19th century, there was a great hope that new discoveries about the mind would greatly assist pastors in helping their sheep. So this goes back even, you know, continuing on from the Puritans into uh, the 19th century. And pastoral 
theology began to embrace various forms of mental philosophy. Then, during the latter half of the, of the 19th century, you know, the Christian faith really had a challenge. Um, the, the faith and the authority of scripture were being challenged by a combination of forces. Uh, what we had was in response to Darwinian evolution, Freudian theories of a powerful, unconscious driving behavior and seeming contradictions between science and the Bible, many Christians adjusted their faith to accommodate these so-called scientific discoveries. Now, over on the medical side, over in Europe, we had, uh, there were a number of different people doing different things, but one of the main ones was Franz Anton Mesmer. And he had a theory of animal magnetism. This was a, a kind of a, a cosmic force that permeated all of nature and that each, every disease a person had, every mental problem a person had, he believed was an imbalance of this animal magnetism. And so at first, he used um, magnets and water. I'm, and it was a procedure, a very complicated procedure with that because he was attempting to, to uh, change the balance of this animal magnetism. But then he found that if he just talked to somebody, he would gain a kind of magnetic rapport. And so it was this talking to the person and, and just being so interested and looking at the person in a certain way, he was able to actually put them into a trance. And that's, this was the beginning of the word mesmerism. And they would go into a trance. Some of it was from expecting something to happen, but they would go into a trance. And um, uh, then when it was moved, uh, when this whole thing came to America, it was kind of divided off into three different things. You had the hypnotic suggestion, which is called hypnosis. Then you had the healing through talking, which was part of what he was doing, psychotherapy. And then you had the mind over matter, the positive thinking and all the positive thinking movements. So he really is considered one of the very early forerunners of psychotherapy. And one historian said um, the, that mesmerism was the first psychological system to provide individuals with curative services that traditionally had been classified under the rubric cure of souls. Now, historically, this is another quote that goes back, talks about this period of time. Historically, modern dynamic psychotherapy, in other words, talking about yourself, talking about your past, going through this sort of thing, derives from primitive medicine and an uninterrupted continuity. This was interesting because this man is not a Christian. He is looking at it from a, you know, a, a, a research perspective. An uninterrupted continuity can be demonstrated between exorcism and magnetism, magnetism and hypnotism, and hypnotism and the modern dynamic schools. And what happened was this hypnotism was being used in order to find out about the unconscious. And this happened partly because of the development of, uh, or the popularity at the time, of spiritism during the latter half of the 19th century. So one history book describes it this way. The advent of spiritism was an event of major importance in the history of dynamic psychiatry because it indirectly provided psychologists and psychopathologists with new approaches to the mind. Automatic writing, one of the procedures introduced by the spiritists, was taken over by scientists as a method of exploring the unconscious. Now, a new subject, the medium, you know, that's the one who is with a seance, became available for experimental psychological investigations out of which evolved a new model of the mind. 
Now, following the wake of mesmerism and all of this research on the unconscious came along Sigmund Freud. Now, he believed that all problems are caused by psychic unconscious determinants of behavior that are formed during the first five years of a person's life, and as I mentioned, usually the mother's fault. Then, he also believed that there was one psychological illness, whether it was mild neurosis or wild psychosis. Now, the funny thing is, is he always worked with the women who had the mild neurosis because they were easier to work with. He never worked with the others, but he figured if he could get something from them, then he could use it with the others. Well, anyway, he continued with his research, and um, of course, a lot of that was under the influence of cocaine, under the influence of idolatry, and a number of other things. And he invented then um, psychoanalysis with its free association. So that was the one cure for the one psychological disease. Now, counseling psychology then continued in its two branches. Until about 1950 or so, uh, it was mainly uh, psychiatrists. And uh, they were quite expensive, and unless you happened to be in a mental hospital. And then, of course, it, the state paid for it. But then in the 50s, what we had was the development of clinical psychology in the psychology departments. And um, to the degree, now, this has been just from 1950. Think about it, how this has exploded. Uh, and we can thank uh, 12 people who call themselves affectionately the Dirty Dozen. And these guys, had a great deal of influence in turning this into a big money-making business, and it was all about politics and money. Between 1955 and 1995, the Dirty Dozen took over control of the American Psychological Association and psychology departments across the nation through politics and money. They tell how they did it in their book, Practice of Psychology, uh, The Battle for Professionalism. They say in their book, the independent provision of psychological services was virtually non-existent prior to World War II. Most psychology departments tended to look down on the applied practitioners. In other words, these were the counseling people. These were the ones who practiced the psychology. Feeling that the true psychologist was the one functioning in an academic setting. Well, what we had was the psychology departments, you know, emphasized research and so forth, so they were not really pushing the counseling part. However, these people, as long they started without science to back them up, they had the money because they got the students, because the students wanted to become counselors, and they took over the, a, uh, the APA, and they were able to uh, get money for the, the different departments, and uh, eventually you had all of these people who were practicing psychology, and it's amazing. If the Christian colleges and universities, by the way, would drop the psychology major, they would lose a lot of students. These are big in popularity, and these grew through this period of time. It wasn't just, I don't think it was just the fault of the Dirty Dozen, though. I think it was people were ready to think about self. And so it was a combination of things. But as long, you see, even though the, um, the scientific research did not back this up, as long as these people could convince the public of their need for professional expertise and keep the facade of science, the psychological practitioners were able to divorce themselves from the results of research and sell their therapy to as many people as possible. Now, Martin's going to talk a little bit about the two camps in psychology. One is the academic research. The other, of course, is the practicing counseling psychologist. And there is a great chasm between the two regarding the research. Really. The, the counselors themselves could care less about the research because, you know, they're right there. They really believe they're helping people, 
even though they do not have the research to back up their faith, which I believe it is. Now, how is there this shift in confidence? During the past 50 years, not only did the world embrace all of this, but the church did too. And so we have this dramatic shift in confidence away from God's word and towards the wisdom of men. And this shift occurred as people increasingly began to look to psychology, more and more to psychology for answers to all facets of life, who we are, why we're here, how we relate to one another, how we're to behave, how we change, all these things. They were looking to psychology for these things. Then, during the 1960s, the Mental Health Association began sponsoring meetings for pastors in their communities. Now, at these meetings, in fact, Martin attended a number of these meetings, so he can vouch for this, what happened was the psychotherapists pretty much convinced the pastors that they were not qualified to handle the hard cases. And so, pastors began to refer their people out to these psychotherapists. Some pastors changed professions and became psychotherapists. We knew some who did this. Now, these meetings continue to this day and now, as a result, people, most pastors refer their people out to psychological counselors. The church has become one vast referral system. But I have to ask the question, why? Why are pastors required to refer out to psychotherapists when they are not asked to refer out to doctors, dentists, plumbers, carpenters? bankers, you know, investment brokers. Why? Because these are matters of the soul. These are matters of religion. And if the local church will not minister to the suffering saints, where else can they send them? So, now we have another movement coming along, and of course this came early on, we have the great psychological awakening among evangelicals. My goodness, if these pastors were going to be sending their people out to psychotherapists, they didn't want to send them out to the godless ones. They wanted someone who would be able to, you know, connect with their religion a little bit. So you had Christians becoming psychological therapists and Christian psychology now. But it is simply psychology being practiced by professing Christians. And there's one quote that we've used in our book, and Dave's used it a lot of times, uh, but I'm going to read it again. Um, during a meeting, and actually it was held in Santa Barbara, and I think that there was a, a man from Wycliffe who was actually staying at our house, I think went to that, those very meetings. We figured that out years later, that the, it was the same time frame. But anyway, this, um, it, this was a Christian Association for Psychological Studies, and one of the psychologists in one of his talks said this, we are often asked if we are Christian psychologists. We find it difficult to answer because we don't know what the question implies. We are Christians who are psychologists, but to this present time there is no acceptable Christian psychology that is markedly different from non-Christian psychology. It is difficult to imply that we function in a manner that is fundamentally different from our secular non-Christian colleagues. Yet, there is not a, as yet, there is not an acceptable theory, mode of research, or treatment methodology that is distinctly Christian. And this remains to this day. Um, Christian psychologists just dip into whatever uh, theories they're interested in. And they don't always practice the same ones through the years. Different ones become popular at different times. I like the way J Dr. J. Vernon McGee described this. So-called Christian psychology is secular psychology clothed in pious platitudes and religious rhetoric. <laughs> Not great. So, why do they trust psychology? 
because it follows, this is the tricky thing, it follows the medical model, sounds like science, and has a special place in the hallowed halls of academia. So, people started, you know, they think the medical model. If you have a broken leg, you go to a doctor. So if you have a broken relationship, you go to a psychotherapist. So the doctor, they expect the doctors to fix their bodies and the psychotherapists to fix their problems. Just as doctors are considered experts of the body, body medicine, psychotherapists are considered experts of the soul, but they are not. Now here's, uh, and another similarity is a lot of the psychotherapists are psychiatrists, so they are doctors, and then you have a lot of the counseling psychologists who have the title doctor. So that goes a long way. Now, medicine deals with a psychological, biological body, but psychotherapy deals with the non-physical mind, emotions, and resultant behavior. So what we have is medicine is based upon science, but psychotherapy pseudoscience. It is based on human imagination. People also trust psychological counseling because they think it's science, but it's not. And we have numerous quotes in our books uh, from various uh, um, scholars in the field of psychology and also eminent philosophers of science. And then there was a study done, a seven years, uh, I mean, a seven volume study. It was um, called the study of, uh, of psychology, the study of a science. And um, the person who directed this over this period of time, after looking into all of psychology, not just counseling psychology, came to this conclusion. Uh, he, this was in an interview um, after the completion of this work. I think it by this time utterly and finally clear that psychology cannot be a coherent science. So although these theories seem to be able to explain behavior, they actually rely on subjective interpretation based upon theories that were established. In other words, if you, if you are looking at a situation and you are trained in, in Jungian analysis, you will see it according to the way the Jungian analysis would go. If you're seeing it from the perspective of another theorist, that's the way you would see it. And then whatever would happen uh, would fit with the theory because that's how you're seeing it. You see everything, you look through um, rose-colored glasses, everything's gonna look rosy, and so therefore, it's rosy. Now, now, although these theories then seem to do that, they really are not. Psychological counseling theories are actually collections of human opinions arranged in theoretical frameworks they're human inventions based upon the perception and personal experience of theorists themselves. They are profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred from the faith. Now, this kind of psychology is so tremendously popular so that there was a book written in, let's see, she wrote this in about, 1995, The Romance of American Psychology. Now, think about when, she, when I read this, 1995 was when she wrote it. And think about what's today. Psychological insight is the creed of our time. In the name of enlightenment, experts promise faith and health, knowledge and comfort. They devise confident formulas for happy living and ambitious plans for dissolving knots of conflict. Psychology, according to its boosters, professes, possesses worthwhile answers to most of our difficult personal questions and practical solutions for our most intractable social problems. She's just saying that. She doesn't necessarily believe it. She says, this is what people expect. Well, it's the creed of our time. Sounds like rival religion to me. Now, another thing she said in the book, in the late 20th century, United States, we are likely to believe what the psychological experts tell us. They speak with authority to a vast audience and have become familiar figures in most communities, in, in the media, in virtually every corner of popular culture, 
their advice is big business. And not only in our society, but in the church. The psychological sorcerers of the soul now set the standards for solutions to the soul. Solutions that have not only been wholeheartedly embraced by secular society, and, but now embraced and expected in the church. Numerous professing Christians have earned their degrees to become counseling psychologists, Christian psychologists, and even biblical counselors. In fact, a lot of people have been trained in psychology and they are actually psychologists, not only call themselves Christian psychologists, they call themselves biblical counselors. But this is the way of the world. Christians should not embrace it, and neither should they be intimidated by it. it. They should reject it as a fake religion. And this is Thomas Saz again, not a Christian, but here was what he says. Herein lies one of the supreme ironies of modern psychotherapy. It is not merely a religion that pretends to be a science. It is actually a fake religion that seeks to destroy true religion. And what we've seen is that this has truly undermined Christianity. Because we see psychotherapy has debased and virtually replaced the church's ministry to troubled individuals. During this time, pastors have been devalued and intimidated into referring their flocks out to these people, to these psychotherapeutic priests. Many Christians no longer look to the pastors or their fellow believers. They don't trust them because they don't have all the training. And neither did they look to the Bible for spiritual solutions to problems of living. Another thing uh, um, J. Vernon McGee wrote to us in a letter after he had written an article titled, I like this title, Psycho Religion, the New Pied Piper, he wrote this in a letter to us. I see that this matter of psychologizing Christianity will absolutely destroy Bible teaching and Bible churches. This therapeutic language permeates society. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of these things that, you know, are here. You've got self-esteem, low self-esteem. These words are used in the church all the time, this language. Listen to this. When you're listening to fellow Christians, this comes up, the unconscious, felt needs, rejection, emotional healing, positive self-regard, negative emotions, addiction, codependence, compulsion, midlife crisis, syndrome, trauma, stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, we have a psychological gospel, a priesthood of mental health professionals, a psychological belief system, and churches filled with potential mental health consumers. Now here's another fulfillment of prophecy. For in the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So what we have here is the psychological mindset, which views self as essentially good but wounded, sees problems as originating from outside the self, circumstances, other people, especially parents, turns people into victims who have been harmed and need to recover from their woundedness through their own inner resources guided by psychotherapy. But the Bible teachers teaches uh, just the opposite. We are sinners by nature. The problem comes from within. The solution comes from outside ourselves, from God himself, through the cross of Christ who bore our sins and purchased our new life, which is received by grace through faith. So what we have, the psychological therapeutic mindset fuels the therapy industry and gives Christians a false view of the human condition, a false justification for putting one's own emotional mental, emotional well-being at top priority, a false view of God that places personal happiness over Christ's call to follow him and deny self. The old self is to be put off, not nurtured. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The psychological wisdom of men only nurtures the flesh, which Jesus tells us to deny. For if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know, we are at a place in the church today where so much has taken over, so much has taken the place of the Lord, and we have to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. See, psychological counseling therapies, theories and therapies really represent a modern Gnosticism with the idea that some people possess the knowledge about the hidden inner person, but you know, only God possesses the hidden knowledge of the soul. Only he has revealed the truth about the inner man through his word. So we know that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. Christians are foolish to look anywhere else, and they're warned against it. You see, integrating psychotherapy and its underlying psychologies with Christianity dishonors God, denies his promises, demotes God's word to a lesser place, interferes with the work of the Holy Spirit, ends up being a form of spiritual harlotry, and is practicing psycho-spiritual idolatry with a Christian facade. Rather than trusting the psychological system, let's just go back to the Word of God and trust the, in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Many are being deceived. We pray that God will open the eyes of his children. A, retru a return to the biblical way is going to be difficult. So let's just briefly pray and just ask God to help all of us do this first, and then when God gives us the opportunity for others. Lord, we just, this is a hard thing. We're in the midst of a whole society that's gone in this direction. We're in, a, in the midst of, of many people calling themselves Christians. We thank you, Lord, that you do have your church, your called out ones, those who are yours. I pray that you will open eyes throughout your body, that they might see that this is the false way, that they might turn to you, that they might know you and trust you in every situation. Lord, that you might be honored in our lives, that you might be glorified, and that psychology will be seen for what it really is, just the wisdom of men that is foolishness in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.